So if you recall, last week we talked about the fundamental theorem of calculus, um, the two directions of the fundamental theorem of calculus, the connection between an antiderivative and a definite integral. And there are two parts of the fundamental theorem of calculus connecting those two ideas in opposite directions. The first one said that we can calculate a definite integral using an antiderivative. I did a shorthand version of it here by integrating f prime into f. So uh, regular f is the antiderivative of f prime. I just constructed it a little bit more efficiently. This is not how we normally write, write things. We usually invent the function capital F and claim it to be an antiderivative, but this works too. So the two directions of the fundamental theorem of calculus connecting the two important ideas is that we can calculate a definite integral with an antiderivative. The other direction said the kind of the other direction. The That sentence didn't work out the way I thought it was going to. The other direction in the fundamental theorem of calculus says that we can construct an antiderivative using the definite integral. That second part is really important because not all functions have nice antiderivatives. So the fact that we can construct an antiderivative just using a definite integral, which means we can construct an antiderivative just by calculating area, that is very powerful because all that's involved in area is length times width. And the only restriction on the degree of accuracy that we get is how much data we can generate and how much data we can process. So that's the important aspects of the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's a connection between the definite integral and the antiderivative in both ways. Calculate a definite integral using an antiderivative, construct an antiderivative using a definite integral. The other important thing that we get from the second or from the fundamental theorem of calculus is the connection between differentiation and integration. So there's the two big pieces, definite integral, antiderivative. And the other piece we've illustrated here, we keep saying antiderivative. So that means that we are uh, expressing a relationship between the derivative, uh, differentiation, and integration as processes. We are claiming that these are almost inverse processes. So the extra piece that we get, differentiation, and integration, are almost inverse operations. So the other thing that we get from the fundamental theorem of calculus says that differentiation and integration are almost inverse operations. Uh, camera is showing on my end. Differentiation and, and integration are almost inverse operations. The almost part is that the derivative, we don't have a one-to-one -one ratio, one-to-one uh, -one, uh, uh, relationship. We don't have a one-to-one -one relationship because the derivative of every constant is equal to zero. So that's why we can't exactly go back and forth. We don't exactly know what a function is the derivative of. We will always be off by a plus C. So the reason that it's almost is that the derivative of any constant is equal to zero. The derivative of every constant is equal to zero. So when we integrate zero, we get some constant that we don't know. Because every constant gets mapped to zero, when we go back the other direction, we don't know where it came from. If I, uh, This is the same issue that we have if I say I squared a number and I came up with four. What did I start with? We don't know. It's either two or negative two. There's no way back. There's missing information because we don't have a one-to-one -one relationship.
we don't have an injective relationship. So they're not quite inverse operations, but this is the only difference. This is the only difference. Since this is the only difference, that's good enough. So this is good enough. The only difference is super predictable and it's only a difference of a constant. And if we have additional information about a particular function that we're looking for, we can nail it down to exactly which function with one piece of information. I do want to bring up, so the, what I want to point out here is I did a shorthand of the fundamental theorem of calculus where we're integrating F prime and it's the difference in the function. So another way that we can read this definite integral stuff is that if we integrate a rate of change of a function, we integrate the rate of change of a function, we find out how much the function changed on that interval. If we integrate a function over an interval, When we integrate the rate of change of a function, when we integrate the rate of change of a function over an interval. We find out how much the function changed on that interval. There's how much the function changed. Here we are integrating the rate of change of f, and f of b minus f of a is how much the function changed on that interval. This is not a new idea. This is what we said last week. When I said when the derivative is positive, we know that the function is increasing, and the area tells you how much. So this is another way to think about the idea that when we when a derivative is positive, we know the function is increasing and the area tells you how much. That's what's going on here. So we'll put a C also. The area tells you how much. So this, when we integrate the rate of change of a function over an interval, we find out how much the function changed on that interval. That is just another way of pointing out that when the derivative is positive, the function is increasing, the area tells you how much function, how much the function increased. When we look at definite integral, we want to see area. It increases the impact of constructing an antiderivative using area. Because we have a whole section, multiple chapters dedicated to finding antiderivatives in chapter seven. And that whole time, it's just finding area. How's everybody okay? 
I know this is all stuff I've said before, and I'm going to say it all over again in the future because songs don't get stuck in your head when you hear them once. In the 90s, there was a commercial for Ford trucks and it had a song written by a popular country artist of the time. I don't know his name, but the, 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 the commercial, I don't know if you're familiar with these, these commercials. It's like a YouTube ad, but on the television and you can't skip it. So the problem was the commercial gave no warning that this stupid song was about to start. It just opened, your screen went blank. They went into the, the, the show went into commercial, right? There's all those pauses in the show. Anytime there feels like an awkward pause because you're watching a show that's streaming and there's no commercials, that's where the commercials were, right? So it's just a quick history lesson. But show fades to black. And then immediately, this is from the 90s, remember? Immediately, this dude was like, oh, I'm a Ford truck man. That's all I drive. And I can't get that fucking song out of my head because they just bombed you with it right out of the gate. Like if it's just like all oh, Ford and then show this dude, I would have time to turn the TV off. I would just like have time to like turn the TV off, not escape the room. Just like, I just need to be able to turn the TV off or mute it. But I couldn't do that. So I'd be like, oh, oh no, they're going into commercial. And then I'd be putting my drink down. Then all of a sudden, I'm a Ford truck man. I'm like, oh, that son of a bitch. If I ever find that person in real life, I'm going to square in the nuts. It's like, oh, how do you like that, Ford truck man? Is it still all you drive? You can tell that's where I was able to turn the TV off because I don't know the song after that. But I can still hear those fucking words. Songs don't get stuck in your head because you hear them once. They get stuck in your head because you can't escape them. So when we integrate the rate of change of a function over an interval, we find out how much the function changed on that interval. Let's look at an example of this happening. Let's get a function and its rate of change. So let's talk about what I'm going to call the function. If I say f of x, the function is x squared minus 3x plus 4. What is the rate of change of this function? What's the calculus word for rate of change? Derivative. So what is the derivative of this function? 2x minus 3. Now notice that our original function had that minus 4. But when we take the derivative, that goes away. Because the derivative is like, well, I just care how much things are changing. I do not care where you started. Let's integrate this function, uh, sorry, let's integrate the rate of change from, let's say, two to five. What, what's this, let's, let's get an idea of what's the function. I want, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, it's fine. What did I say, two to five? Two to five. Let's integrate from two to five the rate of change of the function, two x minus three. Did want to graph it back up in the So here we are integrating the rate of change of a function over an interval over the interval from two to five. And this should be telling us how much the function changed over that interval. 
So that's exactly what shows up. We find an antiderivative. It's going to be x squared minus 3x. We don't know what the constant was because we took a derivative. The derivative constant is zero, but the fundamental theorem says an antiderivative. So important to remember, we need just need an antiderivative. So just a reminder that F, the fundamental theorem of calculus just wants an antiderivative and will evaluate from five, from two to five. Clearly I have not recovered from yesterday. So we'll plug in the five, we'll plug in the two and then subtract. Spelled five wrong again. So five squared is twenty five, so twenty five minus fifteen. I'm never going to remember all these numbers. 25 minus 15 is 10, and 2 squared is 4 minus uh, uh, 6 is negative 2, so 12. So we integrated the rate of change of the, fu of the function on the interval from two to five. This will tell us how much the function changed on the interval from two to five. This means if we take the value of the function at two, that should be 12 less than the value of the function at five. If we look at the function at five, we just get this 10 minus a four. And if we look at the function at two, and if we look at how much the function increased from two to five, that difference is 12. Want to calculate how the difference we subtract. So f of five minus f of two is how much the function changed from x equals two to x equals five, where we ended up minus where we started. So f of five is where we ended up, the value of the function at five. f of two is where the function started on the interval. We subtract for the amount of change in the function. If we look at the graph of 2x minus 3, let me go off by 5, so let's change our window. Uh, 
I want to find the integral from two to five. We could do this graphically on our calculating machines uh, by just doing calc, there it is. Calculate definite integral. So it was uh, the second function of the trace button is calculate. And I want a lower limit of two. I could just press the number two and hit enter and then press the number five and hit enter. So it says that area is 12. We notice that two X minus three, the rate of change, the derivative is positive on the interval from two to five. So the function was increasing on the interval from two to five. The area tells us by how much the function increased. So that is what we are saying up here. If you integrate the rate of change over an interval, that tells you how much the function changed on that interval. Questions? How's everybody okay? So we've got a lot of process. Uh, we've got a lot of information. We haven't done a lot of applications, but that's okay. We're gonna start with our favorite one, because this is really secretly an engineering class. It used to be a math class. Then we needed some engineers, so we kind of made it into an engineering class. So let's look at our favorite relationship between function and derivative. Mostly it's our favorite because there are two really good ones, two derivatives that we use a lot. This is going to be one of our favorites, position, velocity, and acceleration. We're going to think of these as functions of time. So here are the things that we know. The, that We know that velocity is the rate of change of position with respect to time. So if we have a function that defines your position at a particular time, your velocity will be the rate of change of your position with respect to time. Velocity is the rate of change 
of position with respect to time. And we know that the calculus word for rate of change is derivative. Acceleration is the rate of change of your velocity with respect to time. <laughs> and we know that the word for rate of change is derivative. Velocity is the derivative of position with respect to time. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. So this is treating them as functions of time. This means that our Leibniz notation for these derivatives will be over dt, d time, change in position divided by time, change in time. So this, with respect to time part, that means we're treating these all as functions of time. That means time is the variable, and this is single variable calculus, so we only get one. Only allowing one variable simplifies some things, but makes more complicated other things. The important part is that it simplifies the mechanics of what we're doing, complicates the setup of what we are doing. So that kind of tells you what this class should be about. That's my indication. That's why I spend more time on mechanics, because that clearly is what it's about. If we're going with single variable calculus first, we're simplifying the mechanics at the cost of more expensive, at the cost of more difficult setup. So if we come up with names for these functions and we have symbols for the, these functions, it's often we write uh, position as S of T, our velocity, Uh, we'll commonly write V of T, and we will know that V of T is S prime of T, the derivative with respect to time, and our acceleration is, let's say, A of T for acceleration, and we know that A of T is going to be uh, V prime of T, and we get another one. Uh, the acceleration being the derivative of velocity, velocity being the derivative of position, then acceleration is the second derivative of position. So you want to be aware of all these things. We'll call A of T our acceleration function for A, A for acceleration, uh, V of T for velocity, V for velocity, and of course S for position. S is right there, so position. This seems like a very Calvin and Hobbes naming convention, and I'm fully in favor of it. See, a long time ago, we used P of T for the position function, but then we started teaching calculus to high school students, and you can't call your function P in high school, because they're just like giggle and stuff. So we started calling it S of T. But then some teachers make the grave mistake of forgetting that they should use T as your time variable, and they just go back to X. And so it'll be like our position will be S of X, and then that just, it's just a disaster. It's the same reason that the, the, the variable, the, the letter that we use to represent slope is M. 
I mean, obvious, right? M for slope. Because of all the M's that show up in the word slope. And it's, it's pretty clear. S looks too much like a five. L looks like a one. O looks like a zero. E has already been spoken for. It's the base of the natural logarithm. That only leaves P as a letter of slope. Well, we teach this to high school students and you can't be like, oh, the slope P, because then it'll just be like, that's why pre-calculus and graphing is so difficult. Because if there's a point on your graph, it's a rational function. If it's a point where it's undefined, that either corresponds to a hole in the graph or like a vertical asymptote, right? So at some point, you're going to be talking to a high school student about graph holes and asymptotes. And it's just like day is over at that point. Kids are a bunch of graph holes. <laughs> So acceleration, velocity, and position. The units, we know how to make units out of, uh, we know how to make units out of derivatives. We know how to make units out of derivatives. If the units for position are, let's say distance, I'm gonna use meters, then the units of velocity will be the units of position, uh, units of y, divided by units of x. That's how we build units of slope. When we see rate of change, we want to think derivative. When we see rate of change and derivative, we want to think slope of tangent line. And when we see slope, we know what the unit should look like. Slope is change in y divided by change in x. So the units of the slope are the units of y per units of x. x. So in this case, if the units of y are meters and the units of t are seconds, our velocity units will be meters per second, how many meters you are traveling per second at that moment. And then for acceleration, we just do meters per second per second. So it kind of looks like this, meters per second per second. But we simplify this because we don't wanna say meters per second per second all the time. And we say meters per second squared. But you want to be thinking of meters per second per second. And your velocity will be changing. Is everybody okay? Let's combine this with the stuff that we know now. We know that, uh, well, we just constructed these three by saying derivatives. Start with position, take a derivative, we get the velocity, take another derivative, we get the acceleration. So going from top to bottom, these are derivatives. So this direction we're gonna differentiate. But now we know that integration is almost, almost the inverse operation, uh, the inverse of differentiation. So going from acceleration, if we integrate, we'll end up at the velocity. If we integrate the velocity, we'll end up at the, at the position. We will be missing some information because when we integrate, we get a constant of integration that we have to know something else about. We have to know, have additional information, but this, is the, this direction is integration. Word style map up here. Calculus brought to you by Acura.
So next chapters that we're going to be working on are chapter two and five. Uh, you've already started on chapter two, but uh, two and five, they're very closely related. One is, chapter two is like, I'll start with position, differentiate to get to acceleration. And chapter five is start with acceleration and go backwards to uh, integrate, get up to position. Okay. One of the things that we want to recall here are how we built the units. Recall units of derivative. We're going to talk about units of derivative. So remember how we built units of slope. We can see what's going to be happening going backwards. We can see what's going to be happening going backwards, but let's see what it looks like in the calculations. These are functions that I have in front of me, right? So when we look at the integral of v of t dt and think about where this came from, remember this was a multiplication. I wanted to multiply my velocity by my time to find out how far we went. I want to use distance is equal to rate times time. But my stupid velocity was continuously variable, so I had to switch to integration. It's a big jump. That's how multiplication, ha what happens to multiplication when one of your facts becomes continuously variable. But the V of T still represents velocity. That's us saying, here's the velocity. The DT re still represents time. In a very weird infinitesimal way, but still represents time. So the units still work out because the units of velocity are meters per second. And the units of DT are the units of time. And those are in seconds. And so if we simplify meters per second times second, distance is equal to rate times time, the seconds cancel out and we get units of distance. I spelled M wrong. That's because M is slope. That's why I keep writing S. Actually, it's because the last thing I was looking at was an S. So we can do the same kind of unit analysis. What are the, what are the units of the function? Multiply those of the units, those units, multiply those by the units of the dt or the dx or whatever happens to be there. If we're calculating work is equal, distance equal to rate times time, here are units of rate times units of time, that gives us units of distance. If I have work is equal to force times distance, then I've got meter, uh, newtons multiplied by meters and I get newton meters or joules. Any questions, comments, deep thought? All right, so we're going to play with more with this idea of position, velocity, and acceleration. Uh, that's going to do it for today. I believe tomorrow is a flex day, so there are no classes. That's what you guys are going to tell me anyway. Shit, I can't trust you all. You are unreliable narrators. Okay, no classes tomorrow. I'll see you all on Thursday. Everybody have a good day. Everybody have a good two days. And thanks for playing.